what if you could dive into an epic fantasy that contains the same grandeur, scale, and moral complexity that you love so much in Warhammer 40k? Well, you can. With Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere. It's a wide berth of different variety and growth that allows you to really tackle a lot of different things, just like you can in Warhammer 40k. So for this, I'm going to focus mostly on the Stormlight Archives, because here in just a few weeks, the fifth book in the Stormlight Archives is coming out. So I'm super excited about it. This is one of my favorite book series. And if you're a fan of Henry Cavill, which is kind of the king of the nerds, so that is kind of a given, and you're a Warhammer 40k fan, you know that one of the other things he's very big on is the Cosmere, just like me. Uh, it's something that a lot of Warhammer 40k fans, as soon as they find that crossover, do really enjoy. We're going to dive into the Stormlight Archives and talk about what makes it so popular with Warhammer readers and players and what kind of things we can do with it to tie the two worlds together, including next week, we're going to have a video where we do exactly that. We use Warhammer 40k as a baseline to bring one of these battles to an epic scale. And I'm super, super excited about all of this. I love how I'm getting to do this right before book five in the series comes out. So So one of the things Brandon Sanderson is famous for is world building. It's something you see in a lot of both epic fantasy and science fiction, but you don't really see it to the Warhammer 40k scale. You don't get to see all of the layers built in that you do in Warhammer 40k, whether it be with Necromunda and the Underhives or the Ecclesiarchy or the Inquisition or the Imperial Guard, the average soldier or the Space Marines and the Custodies. There's so many different layers that you can enjoy and you can love. And it's something that I've always loved with Warhammer 40k, and I love in other stories as well. And this is something that Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere does extremely well. In modern epic fantasy, he is the king of world building, and everybody knows it. He is famous for having a massive, massive plan with dozens of different series on different planets that spans from the very beginning Middle Ages era fantasy all the way through beyond cyberpunk, even into the realms of science fiction. And he's mapped out this universe to carry through that entire system so that he can write all of those stories. And it's a world building that is on tier with Warhammer 40k. Something you only see in a few things like Dune, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and The Wheel of Time to a point, and Brandon Sanderson in his Cosmere as well. So if you enjoy those facets of Warhammer 40k, this is something that you will really enjoy as well because it's unique, it's individual. And there's so much that you can really enjoy, no matter which facet of it you actually want to read. And because of this epic world building, it gives a chance to create some pretty epic characters as well. And we're going to talk about that next. In Stormlight Archives, just like in Warhammer 40k, there are some very amazing characters that aren't actually good or bad. There's some that lean a little bit more to the good side and lean, or some that lean a little bit more to the bad side, but there's really no good black and white, uh, which is something I know a lot of Warhammer 40k fans love as well. It's a trait that is typical in Grimdark, but not as much in Epic Fantasy, and Brandon Sanderson loves to flirt with that line. One of the best examples of this is one of the main characters, Dalinar. Dalinar is the leader of the Knights Radiant who are attempting to save their planet from complete destruction on behalf of the god Odium. And he's not a great person. He's done 
a lot of really bad things, including war crimes, which I am not going to get into here because those are massive spoilers. But he's a, both a war criminal and an inspirational leader at the same time. To me, he actually reminds me a lot of the lion, which when we talk about it next week is actually who I use for a data sheet for him because both his fighting style and his personality are very much akin to the lion. And he's teamed up with a group of very interesting people as well. Um, one of my personal favorite characters is Adolin, his son, who is struggling with living in his father's image while also trying to be himself. He almost reminds me of a lot of different characters, but if we're sticking with the Dark Angels theme, he reminds me a lot of Belial, who kind of just gets stuck playing second fiddle to his recently returned father. Uh, you also see this with Marnius Calgar when... Um, We also see this with Marnius Calgar when Gilman returns. You also have a lot of the other chapter masters that are struggling with this as well, trying to survive in their father's image while being themselves as well. Uh, Dante is another really good example of this. And a lot of that is what Adolin's dealing with. He has to make harsh choices to both protect his family and his future, um, including marrying Shalon Devar who is struggling with a lot of mental health issues and is embroiled in a lot of other things as well, which are also spoilers. I wish I could tell you, I'm sure you really enjoy them, but I don't want to spoil anything because a lot of that is your key information beyond what you'll need to start Stormlight Archives. And you have the other main character, Kaladin, who is probably the closest to a really good person that you're going to see. He's very much a Vulcan-esque type personality that really, really wants to do the right thing. But in Kaladin's case, he suffers from pretty severe PTSD and has to try and deal with that while also struggling with what it means to become a Knight Radiant from being a poor backwood, backwoods doctor almost to being the leader of a large military unit and having to come to grips with what it means to lose people while also leading them and putting yourself forward. You have Dalinar's niece as well, Yasna, whose pursuit for knowledge is just short of Mechanica-mesque. She's really, really fascinating to learn about and learn about all the cool stuff she uncovers She's not really there for the greater good. She's there to see what she can learn and how she can benefit herself. Another character that kind of has that twisted sense of morality is Zeth Sunsun Bolano, who is a fascinating character as well. He's on a what should be a noble pursuit to right the wrongs that he feels he's committed. But in reality, he's fighting the exact people who really are actually there to try and save it. Um, he has to try and figure that out, come to grips with it, and really pick a side in the fight to better understand who he is personally and what the future will be like. And these are only a small snippet of the really cool characters. There's some that are my favorites as well that you don't get to see. Well, that I don't have statues for, and that really talking about them would be spoilers. But Brandon Sanderson's character growth creates characters that we love. Um, like I said, Dalinar is very akin to the lion in Line of the Son of Forest, where he's coming to grips with everything he's done and having to fully embrace the fact that he is both a war criminal and currently the only hope that reality has. And he's got to try and be a good person despite everything else. So if these sound like characters you'll enjoy, make sure you check out Stormlight Archives. So next we're going to talk about some of the themes we see in the Stormlight Archives that are very, very similar to what we see in Warhammer 40k. So 
So one of the big things that we always talk about with Warhammer 40k is the themes that we see in the books as we're reading them. And the lore is filled with those because it's technically both grimdark and kind of a satire. So themes are a staple of Warhammer 40k. And the Stormlight Archives have those as well. And typically it falls into three themes that I think Warhammer tends to stick with. Uh, and that is war, that is duty, and sacrifice. There are other themes as well that creep in there, but these are the two that I think are the connections between both Stormlight Archives and Warhammer. So when it comes to war, it's kind of in the tagline for Warhammer 40k, where it says there is endless war. In the Stormlight Archives, there is also pretty much endless war. A god named Odium has destabilized the entire planet by killing another god named Honor, and it has left the world in complete turmoil, with several different factions fighting each other, some kind of fighting, trying to stay out of it, while others are deeply embroiled, like the Alephi, uh, which are the race of all the characters I just listed except for Zeth. Um, and this war is the key staple of the story. We get to see a lot of the world through this lens, and the entire culture is war-driven, just like in Warhammer 40k. Everything revolves around getting the right supplies to the soldiers, arming the soldiers, getting them sent to the right place, tactics, how to make things work the way they need to. But this is all layered throughout the story. You get to see all of the elements of war and all of the things that go into war, just like you do in Warhammer 40k. The next one is duty. We get to see this a lot, especially if you read Space Marine stories. Duty is a major staple, oh, and the Imperial Guard. Um, it's just as prevalent in Gaunt's Ghost as it is in the Ultramarine stories. But duty really is a factor that drives both series. The desire to do your duty over all else is a staple of being a space marine, just like it is a staple of being a knight radiant. And finally, sacrifice. Sacrificing yourself for, in the case of the Tao of the Greater Good, or for the Imperium, or just to protect people, is a hallmark of Warhammer 40k. It's where you see a lot of characters either get injured or give their life or nearly give their life for those causes. And we see the same thing in the Stormlight Archives. Duty is the staple factor that drives several of the characters to do a lot of what they do. Dalinar, at one point, his life has completely fallen apart and duty is literally the only thing holding him together. And this duty is something that's reflected through all of the major characters and is a driving force to the story as well. Or, excuse me, this sacrifice is a driving factor as well. Next, we're going to talk about some of the factions that are at play here in the Stormlight Archives and what we draw some equivalents to when it comes to Warhammer 40k. When it comes to the Stormlight Archives, there's really two major factions. Uh, both factions are greater factions. So either you are a servant of Odium, or you're currently working with the Knight's Radiant. And that is a minor spoiler about the Knight's Radiant stuff, uh, but it, it's kind of obvious and picks up fairly quickly throughout uh, The Way of Kings, which is book one. But... Those two factions are the greater factions, and inside those factions, there are several other layers. But when it comes to similar to Warhammer 40k, you really get the Chaos versus Imperium schism. That a lot of the same stuff is true. One wants to destroy or enslave humanity, while the other one wants people to survive. Um, sometimes not through the best means possible, but survival is still survival. The Knights Radiant are a 
very intricate group of people who use certain types of magic called surges to do different things. And in my opinion, the best way to represent them on the tabletop is with space marines. Because space marines give you the ability to have characters who can fly, characters who do specific things as well. And you can get as close as possible to those surges in that category. And on top of that, I went with the Dark Angels because it gives me a few characters that allow more characterization and more success with these characters on the tabletop. Now, the forces of Odium, like I said, are chaos. And they have a lot of layers to them as well. You have some heavy infantry units. You have some that are almost chaos demon-esque. But you do get that breadth as well. So I would typically go with chaos space marines allied with chaos demons to get that good balance there. And if you join us next week, we're actually going to talk about that in depth, how to create a themed game based on the Stormlight Archives using those two armies. And we're actually going to go and play that game. I um, probably won't be able to actually include it in the video itself, but we're going to talk about some of the things I noticed and ran into while we played that game. Honestly, we're probably not going to be able to show it because I'm not going to be able to proxy, or I'm going to have to proxy a lot of stuff. And it just wouldn't look good on video. But I can at least give you my input on how it played, what things I enjoyed, what things I didn't, and talk about these factions as far as the tabletop is concerned. And I think if you're a fan of either the Imperium or Chaos, the Stormlight Archives would be a very enjoyable read for you because you get to see it through a slightly different lens and really enjoy all of its depth and flavor that as a reader you enjoy as well. So next we're going to talk about the deep lore and the expansive universe that really brings it up to par with Warhammer 40k as well. So just like Warhammer 40k, the Cosmere, which is Brandon Sanderson's overarching universe, has a lot of depth to it already and it's still growing. Like today we're talking about the Stormlight Archives, but this isn't his only series. This is actually one of his later series to come out. But there's a lot of really, really good books that you get to see as well. For example, his first book in the universe is Elantris. This was the first book to be released and is extremely popular. It's honestly one of my favorites because it is an introduction as well. Um, hopefully book two of this will be coming here pretty soon as well. But you get to see a lot of different types of magic and different things that are influenced based on a lot of the same situations. Then you have Mistborn. Yes, I do know this is era two. Um, there is currently two series on this planet, an era one and an era two. Um, I didn't grab era one because it's a trade paperback size. It probably wouldn't look as good on video. But... Mistborn, both Era 1 and Era 2 are fantastic. Era 1 is what really broke Brandon Sanderson out to a much higher level. Elantris was successful, but Mistborn has kind of been his staple seller besides the Stormlight Archives. In this series, he's even forayed into graphic novels. He's actually working on a novel version of this currently, uh, but White Sands is a really, really fun story as well. Um, and the graphic novels are the graphic novel is fantastic. Um, I can't wait to see what the novel version does as well. He also has a lot of other stories in this universe that are just piecemeal or one-offs, including three that he released last year in his famous secret projects. I'll link a video to talk where I talk about those in depth as well, including one of my personal favorites of his of all time, Trust the Emerald Sea. This is actually one of the books I suggest people start with if they're reading Brandon Sanderson. It's one of my favorites, and it is a really, really good, just basic introduction to the Cosmere. If you like a little bit more romance, he has done that as well with You Me and the Nightmare Painter. But one of my personal favorites in the Cosmere up to this point is one that I absolutely do not recommend you start with because there's a lot based in this story that it all ties back to other parts of the Cosmere. 
and that is the Sunlit Man. This would actually be a really fun one to do a Warhammer 40k adaptation to as well. Not sure how I would do it, but it could be a lot of fun on top of everything else. Might be a good way to get my white scars onto the table and actually find a way to enjoy them. Because right now, at least at this point, filming this at the end of October, it probably come out in mid to end of November. They are not good. And it makes me really sad to the point where I am currently working on a Dark Angels army. It's, they're all black primed in there and waiting to be painted. Uh, as well as I have a League of Votan army that I play with because my white scars are that bad. And <laughs> there is no real good way to salvage them. Unless I basically throw out everything that makes them white scars. If you've enjoyed this video so far, don't forget to like and subscribe. And comment if there's a series that you would like me to do something similar with. So that we can find new stories that we can enjoy as Warhammer 40k players. And just war gamers in general. And let's just jump to my final thoughts and wrap this up really fast. So that we can go and enjoy either a good book or... If you're seeing this during the holidays, your holidays as well. So to wrap this up, if you're a Warhammer 40k player, reader, enjoyer, I think you'll enjoy the Stormlight Archives as well. They're a great series filled with a lot of the things we enjoy in Warhammer 40k, including war, duty, sacrifice, and the abundance of really, really good characters that tie all of it together into one massive story. But if you don't believe me, you can always look at what Henry Cavill has to say on that as well. And just talk to anyone who's a fan of Brandon Sanderson, and they'll tell you the same thing. You're going to miss a lot if you don't get started on it soon, just like you're going to see with Warhammer 40k. And the combination of the two, they're different enough that you can work through them together and build up that breadth of really cool stories to enjoy your time. Personally, for me, I have a long commute every day, so audiobooks are my best friend. And just like with Warhammer 40K, there are a lot of audiobooks in the Cosmere as well. So if you've enjoyed this, let me know in the comments below what you enjoyed and if, there, if you have a favorite series that you think Warhammer 40k players and readers sh should be enjoying as well. And maybe we'll do a video on that. On top of that, I'm still going to keep working through our Lore Accurate Armies videos. Those seem to be some of you guys' favorites. So if you have any armies you'd like to see me tackle and do a little bit more Lore Accurate, let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And ring that little bell so that you get notified when we have the next videos coming up, including next week, where we take the Stormlight Archives and turn it into a Warhammer 40k game. I'm super excited to tackle that, and I hope you guys will stay and enjoy that next. I'll see you guys. <laughs>